On side two of Blue Hills Revisited, episodes 4914 to 4917, broadcast from May the 29th to June the 1st, 1972. Before that, however, Tim Bowden spoke to writer Gwen Meredith about the development of various characters in the serial. We've had drama, certainly, but we've, I've always tried also to have some comedy. Uh, I don't mean slapstick, or even I suppose we've had a bit of slapstick too, but humour. I think this is most essential. I think people want to laugh. They, they certainly want to have a bit of a cliffhanger now and then, but generally speaking, they want to feel um, in sympathy with the characters. This is it. Uh, and they're, they're more interested in, in whether Ed's going to get his hot water bottle or than whether his house falls down often, you know, because it depends on um, the attitudes you take about this. People like these difficult characters. Now, Ed is a, a very trying person, but as I had a letter the other day and they said, isn't he dreadful? Always reminds me of my brother-in-law. And you see, people like these kind of characters. They're really going. Now, Rosa. Now, now, Rose, my dear. What is there to be so sad about? <laughs> Come along now. It's saying goodbye, oh, Granny. Dear. Poor little Fleur. Poor child. She'll have to build a whole new life. Well, I have to build a whole new kitchen. Yes, well, one thing I've always admired about you, Ed, is your sense of proportion. Well, really, my... Oh, they all dislike Fleur thoroughly. I've only ever had one person write to me that they liked Fleur. No, they really, I'm afraid, they do not like her. But they say we don't like her, but we know someone just like her. Of the letters that I saw, it seemed to me at least 95%, possibly even more, were from women. Did you find that you were writing for women mostly? I've never th done this especially because I know, although some of them won't admit it, that the men come in for lunch too uh, to hear it. I was only speaking to someone locally here last night and they said to me, I don't know what my uncle's going to do. He's trained a dog especially to bring in the cows so that he can get home to listen to it. One woman wrote in when it was announced Blue Hills was to finish, should Blue Hills die, it will be like a tragic bus accident which wipes out a lot of family friends all at once. That is how real Blue Hills is to me. When you hear things like that, how does it affect you? Uh, the letters I've had have made me feel very humble. As a matter of fact, some of them have made me feel that I should have gone on till I died in my boots. Um, but I think most people would agree that that's unreasonable, surely. Oh, yes, well, of course they do. Most of them are saying, we don't know what we're going to do without it, but we do realise that, you know, you've got to give it up sometime. You must be tired, you deserve a rest, and thank you and God bless you. Uh, they've, they've been delightful. They really have. Has Blue Hills been ever a monster for you? No, no. If it had been a monster, I'd have given it away. Do you think your life might have taken a, a different course, though, if you hadn't been doing it? I think that when you have a, um, an instinct to write, you have to write, uh, even if you put it in your bottom drawer. So that if I hadn't written Blue Hills, I would almost certainly have written something else. I think I've, I've been my very great good fortune that I've had the opportunity of writing it. And hours for being able to listen to it. Here now is episode 4914. The ABC presents Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. Fleur returned unexpectedly to High Valley and was bitterly angry at finding Annette Parker in her house. Both Bella and Annette let Jack know of her return and he went home at once. It was anything but a loving reunion, Jack's attitude hardening more and more as Fleur continued to rail about Annette. Look, Fleur, 
I'm willing to let bygones be bygones. It's impossible to forget things. Well, you can concentrate on remembering the good things rather than the bad. And we'll have to do that if we hope to make a go of things. So what about it? Well, you're sliding out of what's happened very conveniently, aren't you? I'm just to forget about Annette Parker, am I? Well, I have a few things to forget, too. And very different kinds of things. And in any case, I was quite justified in leaving here and going home to Mum. I was miserable. And nobody here cared what happened to me, or how I felt, or, or anything. That's not true, of course. It's perfectly true. Did you really care how I felt about not being able to have a baby? Of course I cared. But you're not the first girl in the world that's happened to. The intelligent thing is to make the best of it. If we build up a good life together, we'd be able to adopt children. Going on as we are, no one in their senses would ever allow us to. But I wanted my own children. So did I. But nobody gets everything they want in this life. I also wanted a nice, cheerful wife with a bit of guts who made the best of things. And I certainly haven't got that. Well, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But honestly, Fleur, you'll have to get a proper slant on yourself. Well, the whole world isn't here for your benefit. Doesn't owe you anything. Compared with some of the people in the world today, we have it so easy you might say it's downright indecent. But you go on as though you're one of the have-nots. Well, I haven't got what I wanted. You've got a lot of other things, though. You've got a home, and a family, and enough to eat. And the chance of making a good life if you're prepared to do it. I simply cannot understand the way you've changed. I haven't changed. Or only because I, I've been miserable. Well, they say disappointment brings out the best or the worst in people, and certainly brought out the worst in you. Well, you haven't shown up too well either. I'm away hardly any time and you get involved with some woman. And don't tell me that you're in love with her. Annette and I are very good friends. I'll bet you a lot more than that. Fleur, I'm not going to discuss Annette. Now or at any time in the future. You can say a thing like that and, and still blame me for leaving you and going home. I hadn't said anything like that then. Well, you said plenty of other things. And without even consulting me, you went to work for old Davy Chalmers. I, I'll never get over that. What on earth's wrong with working for old Davy? It's a jolly good job. And a great help right now. It's demeaning. Grace still working on your own property. And you go out and work for somebody else. And a neighbour at that. Oh, for heaven's sake! Are you trying to keep up with the Joneses? Or have you got delusions of grandeur or what? Look, we may as well get this quite straight. If you're coming back here, it's going to be on my terms, Fleur. We're not going to Sydney. I'm going to keep on working for old David Chalmers for just as long as he wants me. And when I'm not working for him, I'll be doing what I can to help Dad and Gray to get the place on a profitable basis again. And we won't be going to Cooma or to Canberra to dance. We never did. Well, maybe not much, but we'll be going less than we used to. We'll have our noses down, all of us. We've got a comfortable home, and we'll eat three meals a day. But for the time being, that will be it. I expect, really, you'd be glad if I decided not to come back. That's obviously what you're trying to do. Put me off. I'm trying to be honest. And I want you to know exactly where we both stand. I'm not putting up with any more nonsense, Fleur. Nonsense? Yes, nonsense. We've struck bad times. And I want a wife who's going to pull her weight to help us get through them. So you expect me to come back here and do nothing but cook and wash up and clean the house and wash your working clothes? That's what Penny's doing. Bella too, for that matter. Even though Dave's in a far better position than we are. Penny and Bella don't want to do anything else. Anyway, they both have children to interest them. Oh, Lord! Are we ever going to get past that stumbling block? He was sorry once. You understood how I felt. But now you don't care. Oh, look, I do care. I'm fond of kids. I'd like to have children of my own, but I'm not going to let it ruin my life. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I do understand how you feel, but it isn't the only thing in life. Come back. Try and put your heart into other things. I'm willing to help you, honest I am. And so is everybody else. Oh, they're not really. Bella and I were friends once, when we were at school, and afterwards, but not anymore. Well, she's taken your side. Why do they have to be sides? We could all be such a good family unit. Well, you don't feel part of my family. I haven't seen so much of them. But I can tell you, if I was to live on the same property with them, I'd make a point of batting in. Anyway, it's not the family. 
It's us. We're the ones who have to make a go of things. And I'm willing to try if you are. I'll think about it. <laughs> Where are you aiming to stay while you think? Stay? Here. Oh, I see. So you're coming back. You're coming back anyway, but you'll consider whether you're going to try and make it work. Hmm. Well, I suppose I'll just have to leave it at that. Uh, but remember what I said about working for old Davy and all the rest of it? I meant it. And I'm not going back on it. And tears aren't going to make any difference to my decision either. You've changed. You've got harder and harder. I expect it's that Parker girl. Maybe we've both changed. This is my life, Fleur. You were willing enough to share it when we decided to get married. If you come back to me, you'll have to go on sharing it. And Fleur... I'd be glad if you made up your mind within a reasonable time. I want to know where I stand. So that you can tell Annette Parker, I suppose. Maybe. Anyway, I'm going back out on the job now. While you think. I hope you'll have your mind made up by the time I get back this evening. You don't care, do you? Whether I come back or not. I'm not going to beg you to, if that's what you mean. It's up to you. Well, you'd never have taken this attitude once. No, I don't suppose I would. But it might have been better if I had. I'll push off now. And not back to work either. To see Annette Parker. I know. Look. If we decide to try and make a go of things, I'll stand by my side of it. I won't see Annette again. In the meantime, we don't discuss her. For so long. I'll be back at dark. You'd better put off your dinner with Annette Parker. I'm not going to have her here. I'm quite sure she wouldn't want to come. Incidentally, I see your father's car outside. I take it they know you're here. No. Oh, for crying out... You mean you just lit out without letting them know? I was upset. Well, not as upset as they are by now, I'll bet. You better ring them right away. Let them know where you are and that you're okay. Oh, honestly, your mother's probably in a fever. say, Jim, it's a great relief to know that Fleur's all right. It's also a jolly good thing that she's gone back to the valley, I think. Oh, if we can depend on her staying there. Oh, surely. Now that she's made the initial move, Meg. Oh, Jim, I don't know what to think anymore where Fleur's concerned. But I do know that Jack's generous. When he realises that Fleur's made the first move and gone back, I'm sure he'll meet her more than halfway. Just so long as this Annette Parker business doesn't interfere in any way. Oh, I don't think there was much to that, Meg. Oh, now, Jim, you're just saying that. Mrs Parker wouldn't have rung me if she wasn't worried about it. No, I suppose not. Still, no use jumping your hurdles till you get to them, Meg. Personally, I think there'll be a reconciliation and it'll, that'll be the end of all the trouble. I just hope you're right. It was good of Rose to ring so promptly, wasn't it, Jim? Well, you knew you could depend on Rose, my dear. Yes, yes. And with Mother there, too, of course. <laughs> Granny's had a trip for nothing. Yeah, a very expensive one, too. All the same, I think it was much better that Fleur went on her own than with Mother. Oh, certainly. A hundred times better this way. Oh, yes, Meg, it's worked out very well. We've a great deal to be thankful for. Not before time. Oh, dear. Darling, I do hope it works out. Oh, it will, Meg. I'm sure it will. The next thing we have to think about is how I get my car back. Well, perhaps when Mother's ready to come home, Jack and Fleur will drive her. One of them could drive their own car and, and then they could both go back in it. In that case, I hope your mother doesn't want to stay too long with Rose and Ed. It's going to be confoundedly awkward without a car. Never mind, love. The main thing is that Fleur and Jack are together again. And so ends today's episode of Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. Would Jack and Fleur ever get back together again? The saga of their shaky relationship continues in episode 4915. <laughs>
The ABC presents Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. Fleur has returned unexpectedly to High Valley and was infuriated to find Annette Parker in her house. She later spoke with Jack, who said he would try to rebuild their marriage if she was really of the same mind, but that he would not consider leaving High Valley, that they would have to live very quietly until their prospects improved, and that at no time would he discuss Annette Parker with her. Fleur told him she would consider whether she was prepared to stay under those circumstances. Jack left the house and has now arrived at Bella's. Oh, hello. Wasn't expecting to see you again today. No, I guess not. I've come to ask you to do something for me. Yeah, sure. What? I want you to ring Annette for me. Well, I, I don't see why you can't ring her yourself, Jack, but I dare say you have some good reason. Oh, my good reason is that there are some mighty curious busybodies down at that boarding house. Oh, Jack, there are busybodies anywhere. Bishops are no worse than anybody else. I wouldn't be so sure of that. Old Ed's so damn righteous, but he always seems to know everybody's business. Everybody in the valley knows about everybody else's business. And it's no use kidding yourself that there's anybody in the whole place who doesn't know about you and Annette Parker. You mean they think they know? Well, could be. Oh, I'm not saying they're aware of all the details or how far the affair has gone. I don't know that myself. And I don't want to know. <laughs> don't worry, Bella. I wasn't aiming to turn you into a confessional. But it's because everybody is so nosy that I want to get a message to Annette without waving a flag about it. Okay. What do you want me to tell her? That Fleur hasn't yet made up her mind whether she's staying. Oh, like that, is it? Well, does she know about you and Annette? More or less. But I'm not going to discuss Annette with Fleur or with anybody else. Oh, that's fair enough. I told you I'm not wanting to know. That's a lie, of course. I'm terribly concerned about you, Jack. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to get sentimental. But I've been worried sick about you and Fleur. And that situation now automatically includes Annette. And when I said I, I don't want to know, I... Well, I really meant I just wasn't being curious. I know, Bella. But I don't feel I can talk about Annette or about Fleur. I'll just say this. Fleur knows about Annette. Oh, not from me, but I think it's the reason she came back. Well, if it's brought her to her senses, it's been a jolly good thing. You make it sound as though I've used Annette. Oh, heavens, no, I didn't mean that. I I'm sorry. And it isn't like that anyway, with Fleur, I mean. You mean she she hasn't come back because she realises she's been stupid, but simply because she's not going to let anyone else have you? <sighs> well, I suppose in a way I can understand that. I'd feel the same way about Dave if he got ideas about anybody else. I think I'd take a shotgun to her. But... If that's the only reason Fleur's come back, well, it's not going to be a very good foundation on which to start again, is it? Oh, look, I'm in a hell of a position. So just do what I've asked you, will you, Bella? Get in touch with Annette? Yeah, well, I think my best bet will be to take a visit to the boarding house. Yeah, I'll go and see Granny Bishop. Not nearly as obvious as ringing Annette. Everybody would know I had no reason to. That's decent of you. So I'll dump old Davy's grandchild with him and go for a ride. Hmm. That's the most natural thing in the world. Everybody would take it at its face value, I'm sure. Mm. Except old Davy, of course. Going for a ride, Bella? Oh, that'll be very nice for you, dear. Do you good. Such a nice, crisp, sunny day. Oh, mm. yes. These days make you feel it's good to be alive, don't they? Mm. Now, are you quite sure you don't mind having young Dave again for a while? Oh, of course not. We love to have him. <laughs> Positively makes Davy's day. <laughs> he's getting to be a bit of a handful, though. Oh, I'll just show him the chickens again. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he's out there now, completely absorbed. He'll be all right by himself, will he, Bella? I think I'd better go and look at him. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Mabel, the chickens are safe. Davy's on the veranda keeping an eye on him. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. He went out there a while back. Lovely and sunny there now. I'll go along and join him. And Bella's going to be back in time to have afternoon tea with us, Davy. Oh, just look at that child. He's mesmerised. Yes, just as well it's a good strong coop or he'd be in with them. <laughs> <laughs> or let them all out. <laughs> Where's Bella going, Mabel? Just for a ride, dear. Oh, sudden decision, isn't it? 
When she was down here a while back, she said she was in the middle of doing the ironing. Oh, well, yes, but she got tired of the ironing. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Mm hmm. Got tired of it pretty quickly, if you ask me. And what's more, I don't think Bella would dump young Dave on you just to go for a ride. She uh, didn't tell you where she was going? Oh, she just said down the valley road a bit. Why? There, yeah, down the valley road a bit, eh? Mm -hmm. Well, if you want my ideas on it, Mabel, it's my hunch she's going down to see Annette Parker. Now, why on earth would she be doing that? Probably to take her a message from Jack. And I'm not saying that because I'm psychic, Mabel. I saw Jack go up there a while back. Oh. But there's something funny about it, Mabel. If Jack and Fleur have made things up, Jack's not the type of bloke to send his sister to wish Annette goodbye for him. Well, um, perhaps he wants to get some other message to her. Maybe he and Fleur haven't made it up. And he's not saying goodbye to her at all, to uh, Annette, I mean. No, oh, well, he wouldn't send Bella to tell her that either. Oh, Davy, we don't know that Jack has sent Bella to tell her anything. No, we don't know, but I bet me boots that's the strength of it. Hello, Bella. Nice surprise. Come on in. Hello, Topsy. How are things? Oh, not bad. How's Mark? Doing awfully well in Cooma, Bella. He'd rather be back on the land, of course, but he says there's not a hope. Oh, tough luck. Anyway, I'm glad things are going so well for him in town. And uh, how's everybody else? I thought I might have a word with old Mrs. Bishop. I'm an old friend of Granny's. Yes, I know. She's round on the side veranda in the sun. Yeah, I guess everybody else is making the most of this divine day. And how's the boarding house going? Any guests other than the Parkers? Not at the moment. I don't think this is a good time of the year, you know. Oh, well, at least you have the Parkers. And if this weather keeps up, they can enjoy the sun too. Probably are. Mr. and Mrs. Parker went for a walk. The last I saw of Annette, she was in the garden outside her room. Oh, well, I'll say good day to her on my way around to see Granny Bishop. It's quicker going through the house to get to where Granny's sitting, or, um, do you want to see Annette? Oh, no, no, just to say hello. Well, we meet again. Yes, it seems to be our day for it, doesn't it? I'm sure you'll forgive me, though, Bella. I was just going inside. Oh, don't go for a minute. Um, I have a message for you. A message? Yes, it's from Jack. Now, at this stage, he didn't want to come himself and create a whole lot of gossip. A bit more wouldn't make much difference. Oh, like that, is it? Oh, that's by the way. What's the message, Bella? Is it... It's nothing definite at all. That's the point. Jack wanted me to tell you that Fleur hasn't yet made up her mind whether she's going to stay or not. I see. Thanks, Bella. Oh, I expect you're thinking that Jack's just hanging around on a string. It isn't quite like that, you know. If she does decide to come back, well, there's nothing he can do about it. I mean, he hasn't any reason to divorce her. And down here is his home and his job. I understand, Bella. And I'm not blaming Jack. I won't blame him, whatever happens. Oh, he didn't tell me to say any of that, of course. It's just a bit of my own. I think he's still a bit in love with her. I'm not sure. But I do think right now he's fed up with her. Oh, mind you, he hasn't said anything like that to me. He, he wasn't very forthcoming at all. And now I've said a whole lot more than I meant to. It's one of my failings, I'm afraid. I'd better get going. I'll go and see the bishops and, uh, and old granny. Topsy tells me she's on the other veranda. Ah, oh, Bella, my dear. How very nice to see you. Uh, Topsy told me you were here. <laughs> oh, news travels fast. How are you, granny? Oh, very well, my dear. Very well indeed. And enjoying this beautiful day? Yes, it is lovely, isn't it? I rode down from home. Oh, very agreeable, that must have been. Ah, oh, what it is to be young. <laughs> Make the most of it, my dear. It's true enough what they say, that every age has its compensation. Yes, it does, but, well, youth is something that can never be repeated. There's a quality about it. Very like the quality of this beautiful day. The two go together. Yes, it is a wonderful day in which to be young and happy. You're not necessarily happy because you're young, Granny. Oh, that's true, my dear. That's very true. 
Now tell me, what has happened with Jack and Fleur? Do you know? Is that why you've come to see me? And so ends today's episode of Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. From Wednesday, May the 31st, 1972, here now is Blue Hills episode 4916. The ABC presents Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. Fleur has returned to High Valley, but so far she's refused to tell Jack whether she intends to remain. Wishing to avoid any more gossip, Jack has asked Bella to convey this news to Annette Parker at the boarding house. Bella does so and then goes to see Granny Bishop. Granny talks generalities for a time, then turns rather sharply to Bella. Uh, now, Bella, what about Jack and Fleur? Uh, do you know what's happened? Is that why you've come here to see me? Oh, no, Granny. I don't think there's anything you and I can do about Jack and Fleur. Well, I don't mind admitting to you, Bella, that I came down here expressly for the purpose of seeing whether I could achieve something. But I think perhaps I was wrong. The whole matter was certainly taken out of my hands. Fleur refused to come with me, and then she came of her own accord. And I was wondering whether she's seen Jack yet. Oh, yes, I do know that. Oh, well, <laughs> that's something. And Jack is a very understanding person. I haven't a doubt that he will be willing to let bygones be bygones and begin again. But it takes two people to begin again, doesn't it? Yes, yes, you're quite right, Bella. Oh, dear. What a foolish young woman she is, though. Not entirely responsible, I think. You can say that again. I, I meant not responsible for her attitude. Well, I know everyone's been fostering the idea of Fleur suffering from some psychological what-have-you, but, well, that's all a bit out of my line, Granny. Mm, but not to be written off on that account. Oh, well, that's telling me, isn't it? But, Granny, don't forget that Jack is my brother, and I'm very fond of him. And I think he's had a pretty raw deal. Well, I think it's been hard on him, too. Well, it's all very well, people keeping on saying Jack's generous. Jack will make allowances. Jack will understand. Well, I mean, how understanding are you expected to be? Very understanding indeed, my dear. When people are as close as marriage should make them. Should make them, yes. But it seems to me that marriage isn't a magic wand, Granny. Oh, you've only got to look at the number of divorce cases. I think you're an idealist. Well, I should hope that I still have some ideals left, even at my age, because the person who is without them has surely lost a great deal of his humanity. I doubt that you could have standards without ideals, but it doesn't mean that you have to get round with your head in the clouds, Bella. But it does mean that you don't divorce your wife, Granny? No, one cannot generalise. I imagine every case is different. Well, let us just hope that Jack and Fleur's marriage can be salvaged and that neither of them will want to divorce. If they do, then it isn't for me, or for that matter, anybody else, to sit in judgment on oh, them. Oh, you're dead right, Granny. I've often thought it's too easy for the lucky people to criticise the unlucky ones. Then we shouldn't criticise Fleur either, then, should we? <laughs> OK, you win. Anyway, I truly didn't come down here to talk about Fleur and Jack. I just called in to see how you were and see if you care to come up and have lunch with him one day. Oh, my dear, that would be most agreeable. I, I should be delighted. Fine. What about Wednesday, Granny? And if Fleur stays, I'll invite her too. Oh. And Penny and Mabel and, um, oh. yes, Melissa Ford. Oh, dear, <laughs> quite a party. Yes, I shall look forward to it very much. Oh, that's wonderful. Now I'd better get moving. I told Mabel I'd be back for afternoon tea. Oh, one reason to rescue my young hopeful and, uh, well, the other to have tea with Mabel and old Davy. He's been sick, you know, and he gets pretty fed up, tied to the house. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Is he improving? Oh, yes. He should be on the job again next week. 
Oh, the helping dad, maybe. Yes. I was very sorry to hear about the flood, Bella. Oh, don't talk about it, Granny. Poor old dad. He's had a heck of a time lately. Anyway, I'd better go, Granny. I don't want to be late. Did you have a nice ride, Bella? Oh, <laughs> lovely. Thanks, Mabel. I went as far as the boarding house and called in on Granny Bishop. Yeah, she's coming to lunch with me next Wednesday. Oh, that would be nice, dear. Well, I wondered if you'd come too. And Melissa. If Melissa's here, <laughs> she's very restless, you know. Well, I knew she went off in Davy's car this morning. Yes, yeah, she's gone to Canberra. She said she thought she'd go and do some shopping. <laughs> what on earth she's left to buy, I wouldn't know. Never seen so many clothes. <laughs> mm, beautiful ones, too. Oh, yeah. However, I think it's only something to fill in the time. What, until Jo uh, gets back from her honeymoon? Mm, and until she decides whether to stay in Australia or go back to San Francisco. Well, which do you think she'll do? I wouldn't know, Bella. I wouldn't have any idea at all. Ah, there you are, Bella. How'd you come back? Hello, Davy. Where's your grandson? Oh, he wore himself out. Now he's gone off for a bit of a camp. Oh, that was a blessing for you. Oh, the times when he goes to sleep in the daytime are getting fewer and further between. You know, once upon a time, I used to use that hour or so to fly around and get a million things done, but not anymore. Anyway, I'll come and help you with the tea, Mabel, and uh, then when it's over, I really must get home. Otherwise, I'll still have ironing all over the place when Dave gets in. And I do think a man deserves a tidy house and a good dinner when he gets in after a hard day's work. Is that you, Dave? Mm. Five minutes early. <laughs> have you had the clock on me? Yes, well, I have, really. I've just this minute put the last shirt away. Sit down, darling, I'll make you a cup of tea. Have you had a busy day? Oh, have I ever. A dirty one, too. Yeah, you should look a bit grubby. <laughs> I've been out riding. Oh, well, it's nice to be some people. <laughs> uh, what did you do with his nibs? Oh, dumped him on old Mabel. Oh, I wasn't just amusing myself. I went down to the boarding house, ostensibly to see Granny Bishop, but in reality to give Annette Parker a message from Jack. Have you heard that Fleur's back? Uh, yes, I met Porky Thompson. He said he saw her going up the valley. Was everything okay? Mm, well, that's the burning question. Well, what do you mean? She hasn't made up her mind yet whether she's to favour Jack permanently with her presence. Oh, hell. Yes, exactly. Oh, will you have anything to eat with your tea, darling? Dinner will be about half an hour. Oh, no, thanks, Bella. Just gallons of tea. <laughs> then I'll have a shower. But look, what did Fleur come back for if she's not aiming to stay? Oh, reading between the lines, I'd say she's determined that Jack isn't going to find consolation elsewhere. Well, surely that means that she's pretty keen about him. Or that she's a thorough-going little dog in the manger. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> I don't suppose it's for me to criticise. You don't ever really know what goes on inside other people, do you? <laughs> it's just as well, maybe. <laughs> yes. Yes, wouldn't you get some surprises? Anyway, there's your cup, milk and sugar, and I'll bring over the teapot, the big one. And you can go on drinking till you drown. Yeah, thanks. Oh, darling, any news from Dad's side of the river today? No, I haven't been in that direction. But we're all getting onto the new bridge at the weekend. Your father and uh, Jack and Gray and me and Sid Simpson and Michael Bond. <laughs> you know, I get to the point where I just can't stand Michael Bond and, and then he turns around and does something helpful. I must say it's a change, though, for him to be doing anything for Dad or old Davy. I have a feeling he's changed his attitude because he finds that... Uh, or he thinks that Melissa's been finally defeated. Oh, I'll have a fair go, Bella. Oh, I'm sorry for Melissa. I really am. I think she's finally accepted the fact that she and Dad aren't going to get married. And then Joe's married Rennie Redding instead of some nice young man back in the States. Oh, nothing's gone Melissa's way. And this must be an awful shock for her. I mm, thought you said you were sorry for her. Doesn't sound much like it. Well, I am, but that doesn't stop me from seeing her as she really is. Now, I do think it's a shock for Melissa not to get her own way. She's gone to Canberra, you know, from sheer restlessness. Yeah, well, perhaps she'll accept the Bracken's invitation and go out to Central Australia. Darling, they're not in Central Australia. They're on their way to Melbourne. Bluey's sick, didn't I tell you? Oh, I don't think so. What's up with him? Well, nobody knows, but Mabel told me this afternoon that she's writing to Martha to invite them down here. Oh, and that'll be a good chance for Melissa to see them again. <laughs> well, I think if Martha's got any brains, she won't come. The very last thing Martha would appreciate would be a visit from Melissa. Your aunt is really something of a menace, you know, Dave. Well, I think she's a jolly nice woman. Well, a bit scatterbrained at times, but, uh, no, I like her. Hmm. Most men do. 
Anyway, I guess she won't go anywhere until Joe gets back from her honeymoon. Dave, I wonder what Joe and Rennie will ultimately do. Oh, well, how do you mean? Well, I wonder whether Rennie will stop being so madly independent and let Joe buy a property. Oh, Bella, there are only two people can answer that, Joe and Rennie. Oh, yes, yes, sure, but, well, I'll be mighty interested to see what happens. <sighs> Is he all right? Mm, it's wonderful. Bella, look, I don't want to think about people and their problems. I just want to sit here, drink my tea, stretch my legs and relax and think how good it is to be sitting here in our kitchen. Very selfish of you, darling. Maybe. Uh, but I prefer to call it being content. <laughs> And so ends today's episode of Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. The final in this group of four consecutive episodes from May and June 1972 is number 4,917. ABC presents Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. Fleur returned unexpectedly to High Valley to find Annette Parker in her house. Later, in an angry scene with Jack, she told him that she'd not as yet made up her mind whether she would return to him. Jack left the house, saying that he would return that evening, by which time she may have made up her mind. Now, at dusk, he arrives. Where are you, Fleur? In the kitchen. Oh, you're getting a meal. Well, there's no one else to get it. Unless, of course, you've made other arrangements. At the boarding house, perhaps. Of course not. Fleur, am I to take it this means you intend to stay? Well, I'm here, aren't I? In any case... Even if I should decide to go tomorrow, we have to eat tonight. Do you intend to go tomorrow? No. I'm sorry, but I've decided to stay. <sighs> There's nothing to be sorry about. I'm glad. If you are going to stay... permanently. Then if you're really going to try to make things work. I'm going to stay. I can't go further than that. I see. Well, I guess we'll just have to see how things go. I suppose uh, this is a beginning anyway. Well, I, I've cooked what I found here. I presume it was what you and Annette were going to have. I don't know what she was planning. Well, something better than you're likely to have from now on. If all we have will be what you earn from old Davy Chalmers. Old Davy pays jolly good wages. I wish, Jack, you wouldn't talk about being paid wages. Oh, look, let's be honest, Fleur. Let's be honest about everything. Life's going to be impossible otherwise. I'm working for wages. So what's wrong with that? Consider I'm damn lucky to get the job. Because if I hadn't, we might be on unemployment relief. Are you just saying that? Now, don't be too sure. Anyway, the point is, it's no use pretending things are different from what they are. I couldn't be bothered pretending that with anybody. Surely to heaven we aren't to pretend with one another. What kind of a marriage would that be? Well, what kind of a marriage is it when you have other women cooking your meals? I wouldn't have had anyone else cooking my meals if you hadn't walked out. Uh, oh. oh, for heaven's sake. Don't let's start again. Will I have time to have a shower before dinner? It'll be about ten minutes. Well, I'll hurry. I've been working down on Lambing Flat, clearing up the flood rubbish. Everyone round here is on the same job. Yeah, poor old Dad has the worst of it, of course. I saw him in grey as I came home. They were still at it. Yeah. Where have you put the chainsaw, Grey? I don't want to dump this on top of it. It's getting hard to see now. Over this side, Dad. I say, I wonder what goes on with Jack and Fleur. Yeah, my mind's been pretty much occupied with that ever since Jack stopped to talk to us. Well, surely if she's come back, it's to stay. Yeah, I hope so, Grey. Well, you know what the alternative is, don't you? Huh. I suppose you're referring to Annette Parker. You know jolly well I am. 
Well, I hope it works out between Jack and Fleur. I'd rather see it happen that way. On the other hand, if they can't make a go of it, well, there's no point in them both being miserable for the rest of their lives. Well, you don't really believe in divorce, though, Dad. No, I don't like seeing people being slap happy about it. I don't like seeing them walk out on their responsibilities. I don't know, uh, everything in the ute? Yeah, I think so. Well, then, let's get going. Don't know about you, but I'm tired. I'm hungry. Yes, I won't turn up my nose at a good dinner. Now, are you going to drive or shall I? Oh, uh, yeah, you, Gray. Okay. Uh, you heard anything from Silver? No, why? Uh, hardly time, anyway. No, I just wondered. Nice woman. How did she and Melissa get on? Oh, quite well, I think. I believe Melissa's gone to Canberra. I hadn't heard that. How long? I don't know. I wonder what she'll do now. Go back to San Francisco, I imagine. Tell Davey would know more than I would, Gray. Who was on the phone, Mabel? And Melissa. They're ringing from Canberra, Davy. Oh. What's Melly want? Just to tell us that she arrived safely and won't come back till the day after tomorrow. Oh, well, that'll be a bit of a break for her. <laughs> a bit of a break for you too, eh, Mabel? Now, Davy, I haven't in the least minded having Melissa. I've told you that before. Yes, well, it's pretty noble of you, Mabel. Mind you, uh, Melly's got a lot of charm when she likes to exert it, but she's not the world's most helpful house guest for all that. But uh, talking about Melly, that reminds me. Did you find the letter from Martha? Oh, yes, Davy. A and they should get to Melbourne today. So, um, well, I think I'll ring you tonight. Or, or maybe it'd better wait till tomorrow night until after Bluey's been to the specialist. Yes, well, it certainly gets some more news then. On the other hand, you know, it'd be kind of welcome to ring them tonight. Yes, I think I'll ring tonight, David, and I'll mention about them coming here. Uh, Mabel, if I were you, I'd also mention that Melissa's still here. Oh, oh yeah, yes, all right, Davy. Yeah. Davy, you wouldn't be uh, being subtle, would you? Now, what on earth do you mean by that? Are you thinking Melissa being here might put Martha off? Oh, so help me, Mabel. Fair go now. It might put her off. It quite easily might. But I was thinking of your cover, if you want to know, not of myself. Yes, yes, I guess you were, Davy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, don't apologise, Mabel, because I might have done it for my own benefit if I happened to think of it. Yes, I wouldn't put it past you either. <laughs> but I think I'll ring about half past seven, Davy. Oh, might be eight o'clock. Uh, it was your phone call from, Martha. I didn't think anybody knew we were here. It was Mabel, Bluey. I'd written and told her. Well, isn't that nice of her now? And uh, how are they all in High Valley? Oh, she said they're all well. Uh, Davy's been sick, but he's on the mend again. I sold his all in the wars, eh? Huh? Uh, what's been up with Davy? Oh, only flu. Uh, Mabel was very concerned about you, Bluey. Oh, I suppose she thought I was really cracking up, eh? You tell her not the Brackens. We all live to be a hundred. I hope that's going to hold true in your case. Well, of course it is. <laughs> Don't look so down in the mouth, Martha. I'm not thinking of handing him a check. Not me. Well, I must say you look right now as though you're about due to. You'd better <coughs> go to bed, Bluey. That's your trouble. Always insist on cracking hardy. I wouldn't be here at all if you hadn't insisted. If you ask me, you're just using me as an excuse to have a bit of a break from the place. Do, uh, <laughs> kick up your heels here in Melbourne. <laughs> I'm too old to kick my heels up very high. Not that a break won't do us both good. Oh, incidentally, uh, Mabel wants to know if we'd like to go down there for a bit before we go home again. Well, no. Uh, that'd be an idea. I really like that valley, and the people there too. Uh, Melissa Ford's still there. I gather she's in Canberra at the moment. <laughs> Pity Frank isn't with us. I always thought Frank was mighty interested in Melissa Ford. I'd say he wasn't the only one. 
Anyway, I told Mabel we'd think about it. To right, we'll think about it. She also said that uh, though they'd like to have us, she should warn us we'd probably freeze to death. <laughs> and I'm quite sure you would, Bluey. You're not used to the kind of winters they have there. Personally, I don't think it'd be at all a good idea. Oh, now, Martha, you're being a bit of wet blanket, aren't you? I'd like to go. Oh, what's a bit of cold weather? Oh, I don't suppose it gets to 50 below. Well, we'll talk about it again after you've seen the specialist. I don't see why that should make any difference. You don't know what he's going to say. You tell me I've had my trip for nothing. That's what you're saying. Well, let's hope he does. But we can't make plans until we know. And really, I can think of places I'd rather go than High Valley. I can't understand you, Martha. Would have thought you. You'd have been falling over backwards to go. Mabel being such an old friend of yours. Yes, Mabel's a friend. What do you mean? Oh, oh never mind. We'll talk about it later. And so ends today's episode of Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. Those taking part in this week's episodes were Jack Peter Whitford, Fleur Juliana Allen, Meg Ethel Lang, Jim John Barnes, Bella Lola Brooks, Mabel Nancy Stewart, Old Davy Edward Howell, Topsy Nairi Thompson, Annette Amber May Cecil, Granny Queenie Ashton, David Richard Meekle, Max Ron Roberts, Gray Leon Gregory, Louis Bracken, Robert McDarrah, Martha Bracken, Winifred Green. Production, John Hannaford. ABC's Blue Hills, regarded as the world's longest-running radio serial, will end in September. The writer, Gwen Meredith, says she's very tired after writing Blue Hills for more than 27 years. The last episode, number 5,795, will be heard on September the 30th. Honestly, I might as well run this place on my own and be done with it. Oh, come on, cheer up, Ted. Well, that bin boy no better than he was a week ago, and young Ted chasing off. Forget the redhead. He soon will, once he gets to Wongalee. I said, I don't know how we're going to live now that Blue Hills is over. <laughs> Why not? Uh, well, the world stopped still in the Kimberleys when it came on. Well, it's been good entertainment and good family life. And, and uh, I think it's dealt with the, uh, the, the ways of country people. And now, Davy, I want you to help me. There are still things to do before Bella gets here. The front needs a sweep. Oh, there are leaves everywhere. And don't forget, Max and Silver are coming over. Uh, okay, Mabel. Though I bet Bella will be far too excited to notice a few leaves. Well, if I ran out of batteries for my wireless, uh, it was like the end of the world if I couldn't hear it. Or couldn't hear from someone else that heard the program. We don't have to see or hear people every day of the week to imagine them in our surroundings even to live their lives with them. But we don't know what's happening to them, Granny. We can use our imagination. They can still be in our minds. They can still be with us. And so, you see, it isn't really so very hard to say goodbye. To say goodbye. To say goodbye and God bless. <laughs> And so ends Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. Half past one on Thursday, September the 30th, 1976, marked the end of an era for Australian broadcasting. Hello, I'm Ian Doyle. To celebrate the bicentenary, the ABC's Rural Drama and Features Departments and Radio Archives produced a documentary series about Gwen Meredith's much-loved radio serial, Blue Hills. These cassettes are based on that series. Shortly, we'll hear about the origin of Blue Hills, a tribute to Nellie Lamport, and the earliest known recording that survived in radio archives. Episode 528, broadcast in March 1951. 
Many of the characters developed by Gwen Meredith, and there have been hundreds of them, became household names. Granny, Melissa, Fleur, Meg, Ed, Old Davy, just to mention a few. After the war, as many as 200 different serials were running on Australian radio every day. They were the bread and butter for many Australian character actors. Gwen Plum, Rod Taylor, John Mallion, Queenie Ashton, Ethel Lang, all at some stage played parts in Blue Hills. Many later went on to television. Queenie Ashton and June Salter, certain women, Ed Devereaux, Skippy and others including Michael Pate and Leonard Teal into a number of Crawford productions. Homicide, Matlock Police and the like. The TV soaps of today owe much to the radio serials of the 40s and 50s when radio alone ruled the waves. How many of these serials do you remember? Dr. Paul, a story of human conflict. Pagan Circus, the show of shows. Portia Faces Life, the story of a courageous and beautiful woman. Presenting Chapter 2759 of When a Girl Marries. Dedicated to those who are in love and to all those who can remember. There's little doubt the most successful of them all was Blue Hills. Over the next few hours, we'll find out how the serial was made and, of course, hear a number of complete episodes. In fact, we'll hear all that are available. Of the 5,795 episodes produced, only 10 have survived. We'll find out the reason for that on side three. The first episode of Blue Hills was broadcast on Monday, February the 28th, 1949, and the serial ran for a memorable 27 years. Gwen Meredith's association with the ABC began not with Blue Hills, but the Lawsons, first broadcast in February 1944. Five years later, devoted Lawson's followers regretfully heard this theme for the last time. The ABC presents the final episode of The Lawsons by Gwen Meredith. And so we come to the last episode in our serial. Jean and Paul Andovich have told the family that they intend to be married. Sue immediately planned a special luncheon to celebrate, and we now find them as the meal is concluding. Sue says, Well, for a scratch lunch, it wasn't too bad, was it? It was a most excellent luncheon. You are to be congratulated, Mrs. Walsh. Oh, it wasn't all me. Ruth and Lois and Mum did as much as I did. Jean was the only one let off today. And uh, Paul... Don't you think you'd better make it soon now that you're to be one of the family? I should be honoured. Well, it's a pity we didn't have a bottle of something for a toast. Then Pop here could have made a speech. Could he, indeed? Well, I'm quite capable of making a speech without the excuse of a toast. I don't think there's any need. Jean and Paul have received all our good wishes. We know just how happy we hope they'll be. Oh, I don't only hope, Pop, I know. Somehow I feel that today's a wonderful day. Yes, I think it is too. It is the most wonderful day that ever has been. Because it's a day when something new is beginning. Not only for us, but for Hilda too. 
Like a Wally and Lois, because they'll have their new house in the pick of the clock. And for Ted, with a new job? Yes, an end and a beginning. I've always found life to be like that. The end of one phase is the beginning of another. As indeed it was, the Lawsons ended on Friday and Blue Hills began on the following Monday. Tim Bowden of ABC Drama and Features and Latley, the congenial host of ABC TV's Backchat, spoke to Gwen Meredith about the origin of the Lawsons. At the ABC Drama Department, they wanted a, a, a play to work in with the, a new department that was being established, the Rural Department, and um, at that time, the rural, the agricultural department, and I suppose the authorities generally, were trying to persuade farmers to grow different crops and do more intensive farming. And the rural department was going to put out all kinds of information about this. And the cereal was to be run um, in connection with it. it was run by the drama department but with the information supplied by the uh, rural department and it was something in the nature of propaganda a sugar-coated pill to uh, persuade people to do exactly the thing they were being asked to do more technically by the rural department but of course in the end the rural department took longer to get going than they expected and um, so they all oh, for six months i just did nothing more i, I did documentaries uh, and then they decided, well, we may as well start the serial anyway. So I, knowing very little about the land, went up and stayed with a family at Gunnedah, or Kerr Lewis, which is out of Gunnedah. They must have been horrified at how little I did know, seeing I was going on the air with it. But they were most kind, as everybody has been most kind in teaching me my business. And um, I did some hard work, I can tell you. And uh, then, with information provided by the Agricultural Department and later the Rural Department, um, and of course there was always a bit of a, a pull between the two departments. I never quite knew who I was working for because um, John Douglas of Rural wanted all his stuff put into it and uh, Frank Clulo of Drama said, this is only going to bog down the show, you see. It's, it's, a, it's a play, it's not a propaganda machine. And so I know I had to strike the balance. You say there was a bit of a tug of war between the propaganda element and the drama element. How did you cope with this? Oh, I suppose by being discreet. <laughs> I don't, don't remember really. Just I think I pretty well did what I wanted to do and uh, everybody agreed about it, you know. It, it apparently worked, you see. It, um, it got the listeners in, um, which was probably the story, although I'm not even sure of that because I think the, the people it, who mostly listened in those days were the people on the land and they were interested in the fact that their own problems were being discussed. The fact that you went to a farm to research the, the whole thing is indicative, I think, of a principle you hold very strongly about your writing, isn't it? That you never write about anything you haven't researched or places you haven't been to. Now that's quite right, yes. This is... Uh, I, I feel this very firmly, especially uh, as it's listened to by country people. If, if you're going to write about something that you haven't uh, seen and that you haven't studied, uh, well, they're, they're just going to be irritated and, uh, well, you just would lose your audience, I'm sure. Berrima, I suppose, where you're living now, is on, well, certainly the fringes of the, the real country, uh, but how many weeks have you spent really out back? Well, now, before the I did the... In Central Australia segment, I went out and spent two months in the centre. Before I did the sugar part recently, I spent two months in North Queensland. And um, of course, I've always known the Monero because this is, well, we've been part of it, you know, for years and years and years, and the snowy and all around there. So I really didn't have to research that. It was pretty well, uh, you know, with me. So well, I, I couldn't add it up and tell you, but uh, I've always ad adored the country. It's my spiritual home, I'm sure. And uh, so it wasn't very hard for me. I mean, uh, when the Lawson started, how did it evolve? Did it move away from the original concept? What happened? Uh, the Lawson's didn't because um, it went on only for five years. And at the end of the five years, uh, the war was over 
and I felt I'd said every possible thing I could say about the Lawson family. And I said, well, this is it, then now we stop. I've written my serial and, you know, I'm, I'm giving, you what, giving it up. Um, by this time we were back in Sydney and um, well, I, don't, I don't know that I had any plans at all, but uh, I just wasn't, felt I'd written enough. And I. And Frank Clulo said, well, I think perhaps you know that this is pity, so perhaps if you have six months holiday. And then gradually, uh, well, perhaps it looked two months, you, you wouldn't need more than two months holiday. And then it went on and finally he said, if you worked ahead, you wouldn't need any holiday at all. Or you could work ahead and then have the holiday and it wouldn't have to go off the air. So the Lawsons went off the air on Friday and Blue Hills came on the air on Monday. But in the meantime, I changed the name because I, as I say, I, there was nothing more I could say about the Lawsons. I wanted a new family and a new background and new area. So I thought, now I must get a name that it doesn't matter where I take this story, anywhere in Australia will be typical. And I thought, what is typical of the whole of Australia? The Blue Hills, which are everywhere. Wherever you go, somewhere you'll see a hills blue in the background. Gwen Meredith, you'll be pleased to hear, is still living at Berrimer, west of Sydney. One of the actors who made the transition from the Lawsons to Blue Hills was this lady. Oh, my glory, Ned. I don't think I'll have anything to do with that. I don't think you need worry about Martha anymore, Ned. I think, as you might say, she's landed on a safe, friendly shore. She's even come to accept me with reservations. Her stage name was Nellie Lamport. That was an excerpt from her final appearance in Blue Hills in December 1965. Few actors have been so readily identified with the characters they played. In the minds of the listeners, Nellie Lamport really was Hilda the Cook. That will be one of my, one of my most look forward to days when I walk into that ABC studio again, and I know I'm going to be old Hilda again. By the way, this is old Hilda, um, Australia, uh, Hilda Walt Walters of Blue Hills. From ABC Radio Archives in the program We'll Meet Again of June 27, 1969, Des Turner and Kevin Chapman pay a tribute to Nellie Lamport. A lovable old trooper passes on. Nellie Lamport, Ella Laura Stevenson, who died last Sunday after a long illness, aged 89. Thousands of listeners will remember the radio actress who played Granny in the serial Martin's Corner and Mrs Hobbs. But perhaps Nellie was best remembered as Hilda in the longest-running ABC serial, Blue Hills. The part she played for some 20 years, back to the original show when it was known as the Lawsons. Nellie was born in England and came to Australia just before World War I. Des, I worked with Nellie many times since coming to Sydney from Darwin in 1956, but you enjoyed a, a closer and a longer association with Nellie. In fact, uh, I did hear that there was a famous story about the two of you doing a special routine together. What about telling the We Meet Again listeners? Well, yes, um, Kevin, uh, this goes back to a few years ago when we had our studio in Market Street in Sydney. Quite a number of listeners will remember that spot. And we were all waiting one night in the artist's room to um, do a show on air, which Nellie was in. And for some reason or the other, she was in a great mood this night and she said, how about us doing a little song and dance routine? And I said, oh yes, and it's all very enjoyable. And we finally got up in the room and uh, we knocked out, I do like to be beside the seaside with a soft dance routine. And uh, I might tell you the artists who were sitting there that night, they fell back in screams of mirth. And that was the sort of, um, that was the sort of little lady she Nellie was. thought that was a lot of fun. She oh, referred to that herself. Yes, yeah. a lady small in statue, but very big in performance. And let us pause now just for a few moments and listen to the last performance in Blue Hills, which was recorded in hospital during her illness. What time are you going over to see Martha, Ned? Oh, I thought we might go straight after lunch. I was wondering whether you'd rather go, well, on your own. Oh, good gracious, no, Hilda. As a matter of fact, I'm not aiming to stay more than a few minutes. I thought you might like to stay on and spend the afternoon there. I don't know, Ned. I mean to say, well, uh, I don't know whether Martha might be going to the hospital. Oh, well, come along over anyway. 
I can always drop you back home again before I go to the job. You're sure that's going to be convenient? Oh, why, of course. <laughs> why, the next thing you and Martha will have to be organising is the christening. Oh, my glory, Ned. I don't think I'll have anything to do with that. Don't suppose Martha will have much to do with it either. It'll be from Juliana and Jerry. As the girl's mother, she usually has the biggest finger in the pie. Mm, yes, yes, I, I expect so. You know, Hilda, you're getting to be able to read my mind. Oh, that wasn't very hard that time. And you needn't worry about Martha being upset. She's quite accepted the fact that Mrs. Van's got to have top place. Oh, well, things have worked out very well for Martha. I don't know whether it's Jerry's marriage or living with Mabel, but whatever it is, she's changed a lot. I think it's a combination. First of all, perhaps it was security, being mistress in her own house, and then it was friendship with Mabel. I don't think you need worry about Martha anymore, Ned. I think, as you might say, she's landed on a safe, friendly shore. She's even come to accept me with reservations. There can be no reservations about this statement. Nellie Lamport will not only be missed by the radio listeners throughout Australia, but by all her friends in show business and their legion. And she was indeed a lovable woman and a real trooper. Nellie Lamport passed away on Sunday, June the 22nd, 1969, aged 89. The last episode she appeared in was number 3609, broadcast on Wednesday, the 15th of December, 1965. By that stage, she had been confined to hospital. It was two days after Nellie's final appearance in Blue Hills that this recording was made to be broadcast on Lorna Burns popular country women's session. Hello, everyone. This is Granny Bishop speaking. In a moment, you're going to hear Hilda. I'm sure you're all waiting for this particular occasion. She's going to say hello to you all. I'm Queenie Ashton, and I'm with Nellie now, and I'm going to introduce you to her. Come along, Nellie, it's your turn. You've got to say a few words to all the listeners who've been so kind right. to you. Yes. Well, hello, Australia. I'm awfully glad to have this opportunity, and I'm very grateful to Lorna Byrne for putting me in her session and enabling me, me to talk to Australia, which I feel I am doing now. I'm so grateful to all the people who've written to me and sent me cards, and... Uh, not only cards, but all sorts of nice things said to me, which is very uh, morale-lifting to me. Well, you deserve it, dear. Every, you see, it just makes you realize how much everybody loves you. Oh, my word, you're giving me a swollen head? Not a bit. Well, you've got to hurry up now, and everybody's waiting for you to come back. Well, I think one of the happiest days of my life will be when I walk into the ABC studio and hear Eric John say to me, Now then, Nellie, speak into the mic. Right. Don't move away from the mic. <laughs> and you know that gruff way he'll scold me? Well, I'm one waiting for him to scold me and tell me to speak into the mic, Nellie. And you'll give him something back to, won't you? Bet your life. <laughs> And Peter will take a mean advantage of it and he'll come all the producer over me. <laughs> he, he and Eric together, what I shall do with them, I don't know. We're looking forward to having you back with us, dear. Well, darling, I think possibly that we'll have to sort of close off now. Thank you very much for coming, Queenie. And um, Lorna and Peter. And Lorna, thank you very much for putting me in your session. I remember, I forget how many I've done for you, for your, for your session, but I know I've enjoyed them all. Say cheerio, Nelly. Cheerio, Australia. Cheerio, Enjoy everybody. Until the new year, and then I'll wish you all a happy new year. I'll do it in my thoughts and uh, openly, too. Uh, in fact, I'll roar it at the top of my voice when, on New Year's Day. That's right. I shall say, hello, Australia, God bless you all, and a Merry New Year. It wasn't long after that recording was made, in May the following year, that Lorna Byrne announced her retirement as producer and presenter of what was another institution for ABC Radio listeners, the Country Hours Women's Session, formerly the National Farm and Home Program, which ran for 14 years.
Lorna Byrne, in her final program on the 6th of May 1966, reminisced about her years as a broadcaster, including a country visit with Nellie Lamport. There have been some delightful incidents throughout the years. There was the time I took Hilda, Nellie Lamport, to Goulburn with me, where we both had an hilarious time as guests of the local Red Cross. We had a good friend there, or I had, the late Mr Turner, who had a butcher's shop. And he was so pleased when I took Nellie in to see him that the news travelled round so quickly in a few minutes the shop was crammed chock-a-block full of people. He gave each one of us two pounds of his very best sausages. And that's something we've both never forgotten. Nellie reminded me of this when I saw her a fortnight ago. She was delighted with the beautiful cake that Mrs Masters of Tumut had made and which was presented to her by the CWA. And she sends her love to you all. The memorable voice of Lorna Byrne, who will be pleased to hear celebrate her 90th birthday just a few days ago. Let's now go back to episode 528, broadcast in March 1951. This is the oldest known recording of Blue Hills. It was transferred to an acetate disc and sent to Perth. No one knows why. Fortunately, it found its way back into ABC Radio archives and is now able to bring back the story and characters of 37 years ago, even if it's somewhat scratchy in quality. The scene is the cottage of the Walters pig farm near Tenimbla. Although it's quite early in the evening, Joe and Hilda Walters are both asleep in their chairs when Ted Lawson comes in. Good night, Hilda. Huh? Oh, my glory. Ted, you scared the daylight out of me. How did you get in? Walked in. Oh, it's these sleepy hollow chairs that Sue and the missus gave us. Joe! What's up? Oh, oh I must have been asleep. You're making enough noise to wake yourself. Ted's here. Oh, oh. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, I didn't see you, Ted. Well, how are you? Not bad, thanks, Joe. Sorry to disturb your yeah. dreams. Were they good? You had rather a beatific smile. A beatific? <laughs> I'd just call it a vacant look. But sit down, Ted. Hey. Emmy said you were coming to call for her. Got a message to her at work, did you? Yes, resourceful, aren't I? Oh, most anybody would have thought of it. Ah, oh, there you are, Emmy. Come in, let's have a look at you. Good night, Ted. Good night, Emmy. Hmm? I say you look very nice. Yes. The first time I've worn this dress. It's the one Miss Witherston gave you, Ted. And that Hilda blamed me for. Oh. Well, it'll be quite your form. Turn round, Emmy. Yeah, yeah. let's get an eyeful of the back. Mm. Yeah. Mm, looks just as nice as the front. And that's important. So many people think that what they can't see themselves is invisible to other people, too. Well, I expect you've got to move on, haven't you? You don't want to be late. Uh, we'll see you later, Hilda. Much, much later. What time are you going to be home? Don't uh, answer that, Emmy. Maybe taken down and used as evidence against you. Ted, I asked you, when will you be bringing Emmy home? I haven't an idea. Depends what cook. But I think you'd be ill-advised to wait up. I won't be too late, Aunt Hilda. Good night. Good night. Oh, enjoy yourself. Good night, Joe. Good night, Em. And don't go missing any fun for fear of getting ticked off by Hilda when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, Ted. Hello, Joe. Goodbye, Hilda. Goodbye. The characters in these scenes from episode 528 were played by the actors who originally created them. Joe by Reg Collins, Ted by Rupert Chance, Emma by Gwen Plum, and of course, Hilda by Nellie Lamport. On the occasion of the 3000th episode broadcast during 1962, Malcolm Billings spoke to Nellie Lamport about the serial. I get the feeling that the actors in Blue Hills um, uh, take a keen interest in the script because oh, the yes. script is so carefully prepared. Oh, yes, and we're so at home with our characters. Mm. Well, Gwen once said we gave her a little luncheon on the, I think it was the 1500th episode, and she gave a little talk afterwards, and she said, really, the, the characters could almost write themselves, <laughs> you know, yeah. that we were so in it. The um, reality uh, that the characters have has quite an effect on the listening public, I understand. Do, the, do they really regard you as a family? In, it's incredible. Mm. Well, when... Uh, now, let me see. Chris... Now, that was in the Lawsons. Law, Chris Lawson got married, and uh, his wife was going to have a baby. And you'll hardly believe it, but one listener made some booties and sent them in uh. for the baby. <laughs> <laughs> and also, when the rationing was on, you know, all the coupons. During the war. Yes. Mm. Well, of course, Hilda's always making a cup of tea. Hilda's always getting down the cups to make a cup of tea. Uh. And uh, do you know that listeners sent in coupons to Hilda? 
tea coupons because oh. they thought, you know, she must be using so many of her own. But Nelly Lampo didn't get them. I don't uh. know where they, where they arrived en route. The booties and tea coupon stories have become part of the folklore of Blue Hills. Here, long-time sound effects man Peter Wilkinson has another version. Nellie told me one day, when she was thinking back to the early days of Blue Hills and the Lawsons, that so many listeners made the serial a part of their lives, which is still the case today, by the way. And when one of the characters was having a baby, some people sent in booties to the ABC. Also, during the war, when tea was rationed and coupons were needed, because Hilda was always making cups of tea, a number of listeners sent her tea coupons. I said to Nellie, what did you do with the coupons? She chuckled, I kept them, of course. So what's the truth, and what does it really matter? Nellie Lamport spent the last five years of her life confined to the hospital bed before she finally passed away in 1969. Tim Bowden is speaking here with Gwen Meredith. I knew that Nellie was very ill, and we even took the uh, recording outfit out to the hospital and did a few in hospital, and then I had her... Um, I, d I can't remember whether she was living in Tasmania or whether I had a move to Tasmania. And just I, after that, I didn't bring her as a serial. I had people speak about her, you know, how's Hilda doing? And we someone get a letter from her. But uh, I, never br I didn't ever put another actress in her place because I didn't think they could, anyone could really do it just that way. So she went to Tasmania and stayed she went, there? She went to Tasmania and she's still there. In a few moments, we'll hear Nellie Lamport in Blue Hills episode number 528 from March 1951. Before that, however, the significance of the institution that Blue Hills became over 27 years can be gauged from listener reaction to the ABC changing anything to do with the serial, especially the time of its scheduled broadcast and its daily repeats. Many listeners' days were punctuated by the broadcast at one o'clock and its repeat later in the evening. From Radio Archives, here's a report from PM in March 1976. The announcer is Hugh Evans. The ABC's switchboards around Australia were jammed last night by thousands of bewildered listeners who wanted to know what had happened to the evening repeat of that hallowed institution, Blue Hills. The Blue Hills repeat, unfortunately, is another casualty in the ABC's economy drive. And just to show that we do take notice of your telephone calls, Kate Bailey recorded some of them. Yes, I want to complain of the cancellation of Blue Hills at quarter to seven every night. It's a way of life in my household, from a 12-year-old right through to a 19-year-old and then the older members of the family. I think it's terrible. I just couldn't believe it. I didn't think that the political uh, atmosphere in the country at the moment would have gone as far as to affect Blue Hills. It's one of the small pleasures of life that we get accustomed to listening to. And my family, we gathered together around the dinner table at night and we're all together and we just love listening to it. What difference will it make to your family life now that Blue Hills is no longer there in the evening? Well, we won't be so inclined to all be there together at the table at a quarter to seven. Will it make a great deal of difference to your life not having Blue Hills yeah, in the evening? Yeah, it quite a lot of difference to our lives. I mean, you, these things become... You, you look forward to them, you become... Uh, Sort of, it becomes part of your life. You discuss the things and you uh, wonder what's happening. And uh, if you miss an episode, you're very disappointed and you ask somebody else what's happened. I think at the moment, the way I feel, I don't think I'm bothered to listen to the ABC at all. Has Blue Hills been really important in your life? Oh, yes. We've, we've followed it. They're like uh, personal, you know, real pe people to us. And it's, I think it's a very good morals in it, too good attitude to life and everything like that. Well, I've been uh, listening to Blue Hills all my life. The whole family's been listening to Blue Hills and we're very disappointed that Blue Hills isn't on anymore. We wanted to get it back. I have been listening to it for just so many years when I lived in New Guinea and when I came back to Australia to live and we just love listening to it. Do you think that Blue Hills listeners should take some action? Yes, I think so, yes. I'm sure there's enough people who are sufficiently interested to... Uh, if they all contacted the ABC, they should carry some weight. That's the way it's done. I'll be back again tomorrow evening at the same time with another edition of PM. And until then, from Hugh Evans, good night. Nothing came of the cries of shock and horror. The ABC didn't reinstate the evening repeat, but the end of the serial itself wasn't that far away.
As mentioned a while ago, the earliest known recording of Blue Hills is episode number 528, broadcast for the first time in March 1951. Even though the reproduction from the acetate disc is a little scratchy, you'll have no difficulty in recognising the voices of Nellie Lamport as Hilda and a youthful Gwen Plum as Emmy. ABC presents Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith, episode 528. Laura Barry is returning to the city, and Trixie is going with her to begin a course in training for the theatre. Peter Frobisher has also decided to conclude his partnership with Neil, and consequently is also leaving. As a farewell to them all, a party is being held at Blue Hills, and we left Mandy stirring Bruce to action just as the first guests are arriving. He is far more interested in talking over ways and means of stocking the folly, but finally is forced to the duties of host and is now talking to Max and Sue Ralston. I'm so glad you could come along, Max. There's a general exodus from here, you know, the mass migration scheme. So I understand. A further drift to the cities. The pity. But I don't suppose Trixie or Miss Barry or Dr. Frobisher could actually be claimed as really belonging to the bush, could they? Well, we hoped we had them to stay. What's Frobisher aiming to do, Bruce? I really don't know. <laughs> Seems a bit vague about it himself. Oh, that doesn't fit in with my mental conception of him. No. Well, he always seemed a reliable sort of chap. Bruce, there's some new arrivals. Oh, excuse me a minute then, will you? I think Peter Frobisher's trouble is feminine. Frobisher? Yes, and her name is Trixie Gordon. Personally, I don't think they're very well suited. Do you know them well enough to judge, Scrap? Oh, possibly not. Just my instinct. One of Hilda's feelings. No, I wouldn't rely on it then, sweet. Shall we go over and join young Mandy? She's looking somewhat perplexed. Good idea. You know, I think someone like Mandy now would be much righter for Dr. Frobisher. However, you never know who's going to be successful who, do you? What's the matter, Mandy? You look like Atlas. He was the chap of the world in the show, wasn't he? I can remember him on the front of my school atlas. <laughs> That's the one. Well, it's not quite as staggering a burden as that. I'm just wondering whether to start up the gramophone. Why not? It's nothing like music at a party. Hmm. That's what I think. But I'm not sure whether there are enough here yet. Will you and Max dance if I put on a record? Oh, we'd love to. Oh, I expect I can still creak around. What's that one I like, Sue? da da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum You know it. Of course. Yes, we've got that. That's a good tune. It's got a bit of melody in it, which is more than you can say for a lot of them. It used to be Emmy's favourite, too. Used to be? <laughs> oh, I see we're a bit behind the times, Max. Where is Emmy? Didn't you tell me that she was going to be here? Yes. Bruce was going for her, but, well, then we got a message to say Ted was bringing her. Oh. <laughs> Good night, Hilda. Oh, my glory. Ted just scared the daylights out of me. How did you get in? Walked in. Ah, oh, it's these sleepy hollow chairs that Sue and the missus gave us. Joe! <coughs> What's up? Oh, oh I must have been asleep. You're making enough noise to wake yourself. Ted's here. Huh? Oh, <coughs> Oh, yes, yeah, well, I didn't see it, Ted, well, how are you? Not bad, thanks, Joe. Sorry to disturb your uh, dreams. Were they good? You had rather a beatific smile. Beatific? <laughs> I just call it a vacant look. But sit down, Ted. Yeah. Emmy said you were coming to call for her. Got a message to her at work, did you? Yes, resourceful, aren't I? Oh, most anybody would have thought of it. How's the cow hang? Dusty. Yeah, the new roads aren't sealed yet, are they? No, the range looks a mess. All the cuttings and workings going on. Necessary, of course, you've got to have progress. Yeah. Pretty though it has to be so ugly so often, isn't it? Ah, the bush will cover it again. I'll lay me dough on the bush any time. You only have to look at the old roads, or I'll soon they go back to nature. Yes, you're right there. And the water and the power that's going to come out of the range when this scheme's finished, worth the death of a few trees. 
never like to see the trees go. There's been too many cut down in this country. Far too many. Oh, well, then, let's start a discussion on erosion. Oh, Judd, I don't mind when it's necessary, as it is in this scheme. It's the vandalism that gets me. Fellas cutting the trees down for the heck of it and pulling up wildflowers and shooting birds. Hmm, by Joe. Your house looks for good, Hilda. Isn't it lovely? I have to pinch myself every morning when I wake up and look at it. I think I'm dreaming that when I blink, I'll be back to the test again. I hope you've uh, had your last experience of a tent. Well, between you and me and the gate post, Ted, so do I. Ah, there you are, Emmy. Come in, let's have a look at you. Good night, Ted. Good night, Emmy. Mm, I say you look very nice. Yes. The first time I've worn this dress. It's the one Miss Witherston gave you, Ted. And that Hilda blamed me for. Oh. Well, it'll be quite your form. Stand round, Emmy. Yeah, yeah. let's get an eyeful of the back. Mm. Yeah. Mm, looks just as nice as the front. And that's important. So many people think that what they can't see themselves is invisible to other people, too. Well, I expect you better get a move on, haven't you? You don't want to be late. Joe just wants to get back to that dream he was having. Aren't they lovely chairs, Ted? Excellent. You and I'll have a couple when we're married, Emmy. I know I can see you snoring off, Ted. <laughs> After a week's trucking, I feel like it anyway. You tired, Ted? Oh, not too tired to go to the Gordon's party. Now, come along. Uh, we'll see you later, Hilda. Much, much later. What time are you going to be home? Don't uh, answer that, Emmy. You may be taken down and used as evidence against you. Ted, I asked you, when will you be bringing Emmy home? I haven't an idea. Depends what cook. But I think you'd be ill-advised to wait up. I won't be too late, Aunt Hilda. Good night. Good night. Mm, enjoy yourself. Good night, Joe. Good night, Em. And don't go missing any fun for fear of getting ticked off by Hilda when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good night, Ted. Well, on, Joe. Goodbye, Hilda. Goodbye. I hope you don't mind a truck for a carriage, darling. It's way ahead of a pig cart. Joe should buy a talkie. Oh, he says he will one day, Ted. But not till the farm's a bit more in the clear. I didn't tell you inside. You look beautiful. Thank you. Ted, why are you slow? Moon is coming through the window onto you. If I don't stop driving, I'm likely to have an accident. But we'll be late for the party. Even that is better than landing in a ditch. I have to give my attention to you or the road. The road wasn't doing too well. Ted, please, I, I thought you'd agree to, to... Well, to go back to where we used to be, huh? How we used to feel. But you didn't look so beautiful. The light making you into something by like silversmith. I tell you not to be absurd. So say you can alter emotions by making resolutions about them. In any case, I've been feeling this way about you for far too long already. And it isn't any use you trying to tell me you look on me as a nice big brotherly type, but... Nobody could ever think of you as that, Ted. I've never wanted them to. And I certainly haven't ever wanted you. Emmy, I love you and I want you. Why are you being stubborn about it? Because I'm not... I'm not sure about that, Ted. About what you just said. That may be the middle bit of it. That's only part of it. I've explained that to you. And that's happened a fair few times. But this is a lot more important. I want to marry you. And there's only one other woman I've ever wanted to marry. Claire Turner. Yes, Claire Turner. She wouldn't have me. She knew I wasn't good enough. Same as you know, I suppose. Is that it, Emmy? Is it self-defense, really? No, of course not. You know perfectly well I... What? Nothing. And you are like Claire. Seems to be my bad luck in life that neither of the women I've loved cared enough for me. Oh, that's not true, and you know it. You're not playing very fair, Ted. You're, you're just trying to trick me into an admission, and... I don't admire you very much for that. I feel you. But you, you know, you've always known that I'm not a particularly admirable person. I was hoping you cared in spite of my cabbage propensity. However, perhaps you'd better not go on with it now. I bought you some flowers. Oh, Ted. I hope you liked them. I didn't know what you were wearing, so I played set. Just a few little slipper off. Oh. Here you are. But you should look up the anything. I see every reason why I should. An escort should always provide flowers. But you partner. aren't really my escort. What am I then? Well, I mean, you, 
You're just a self-appointed one. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, they're lovely. I think there's a pin there somewhere. I felt them to include a couple of large ones. Oh, you think of everything. Perhaps I've had plenty of practice. Yes, I'm sure you have. <laughs> but you're not going to spoil the pleasure of them for me by talking that way. You're such a mixture, Emmy. What? You show so much common sense over a small thing, but so much stubborn pride over marrying. And it's just a waste of time and effort, you know. Why should you say that? Because you will marry me in the end. I don't think so. I do. Because I've made up my mind, and when I really want something, I usually get it. I could remind you that... What are you going to say? I've changed my mind up. I'm just about to be quite unforgivable. Were you? Then I can guess what you had in mind. You're going to tell me that I didn't get Claire. No, I didn't get her. But Claire's not as kind as you, Amy. Not nearly as kind. And without you and me, Claire, you're the one that's been kind. Me? Yes, of course. Every person has pride, and you're just trying to save mine. I appreciate it. But there's no need. Truly, there isn't. You've done all that's necessary now, and so you can forget it, because... Well, you see, whatever I might feel for you, I, I wouldn't want to marry anyone who was offering to marry me out of kindness. But I'm not offering. Not only for their sake, but for mine. I don't think I deserve to be happy, and I don't think I would be. But, Emmy, I've told you, do I have to shake this knowledge into your head? I've told you again and again, I, I want to marry you. For heaven's sake, don't you see? I won't be satisfied until I do marry <laughs> So ends episode 528 of Blue Hills by Gwen Meredith. The theme for Blue Hills, Pastoral, was written by British composer Ronald Hamner and performed by the New Century Orchestra. Here it is now.